Are you ready? I am ready to receive and obey the Word of God. I want to read you a little more of the paragraph that is in your study guide, just so we can see Job speaking of his belief in the resurrection. His belief in the resurrection. Job 19, 23 and following is a very familiar passage. Job says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. And here they are in the book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in rock forever. I've seen numerous rocks that have this verse inscribed upon them. Thank God they are written in rock. For I know, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. You want to know who the victor is? Our Lord is the victor. Hallelujah. Let's don't act like we're defeated. We're not defeated. Let's act victorious because we are victorious in him. Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He will stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin, worms destroy this body. So much for cremation. And though after my skin, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Hallelujah. We'll talk about that more in the message in a little while. I'm going to see God, and he's going to stand on the latter day upon the earth. Come on, somebody thank God for the victory that is ours, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Thank God, thank God. In my flesh, well, the worms had their time, but they're going to give up when I'm raised from that grave. Hallelujah. And I will see God with my very own flesh, a new and a glorified body, to be sure, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Reading on. But ye should say, why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that you may know, say it with me, there is a judgment. Could we say it again? There is a judgment. I think the thing least preached in all the Bible is the judgment of God to come. The judgment. There is a judgment. We're talking tonight about the resurrection of the dead, and I rejoice to tell you that one day the graves will open and those who are dead in Christ shall indeed rise first. It is Job who has faced such amazing difficulties in his body and in the experience of his life losing his children and all the things that have happened to him as Satan's power was basically unleashed upon this faithful man who loved God, served God faithfully. Yet this man stands in spite of those friends that are really persecuting him with their words of accusation. This man stands and he holds on to his faith. Covered in boils. He was in such bad shape that when his friends first saw them, they were in complete silence and astonished at how bad things were for Job. I can well imagine not having any medical care like we have in the modern world today, how difficult a time Job was having, and of course his friends were only adding to his grief. Yet, Job held on to his faith. God grant to us, in spite of any circumstance of life, that you and I will hold on 
to our faith. For I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. It is a wonderful thing to serve God for the day in which we live. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. But that is nothing to be compared with the day that will come when God shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Yes, they'll all gather, all the kings, all the nations, all the armies of the world will gather to make war with the saints, to make war with Israel, to make war with Jesus himself. But the end of that matter is that God stands victorious over all. And then once we die, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Who preaches that anymore? You don't hear it on the television ministries of our day, yet it is the truth of God's Word. Here is Job in his faith, knowing that after he dies, by the way, that was something he had sought for earnestly. He had pleaded with God early on to take his life. It would be better for me had if I had never been born, Job says. But now he rises in faith to proclaim this great message. It doesn't sound very appealing as it begins in verse 26 that worms would destroy this body. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Friends, you're believers. Everyone in this room is a believer. We're going to see God. Hallelujah. Years ago, my wife and I made a trip to Washington, D.C. and saw all the sites there, the House and the Senate and the monuments and Arlington. It was the longest walking day of my life, particularly in the Smithsonian and then on to Arlington Cemetery and all the monuments in between. And then, of course, we stood in this long, long, long line of people that were waiting to go in and see the White House. And I am telling you the absolute truth. This is just the way it happened. After hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people made their way to go into the White House, there was a couple right in front of us, and then there was us, and they stopped the line, two people in front of us. We could not see the White House. I kind of figured out why. The president at that time probably looked out the window and saw me and said, don't let that guy in. I'll tell you after church and after the recording who the president was. That's nothing. In my flesh, I shall see God. And while I may not be allowed in the White House, I can tell you this, I've got a mansion in glory, a place prepared, a dwelling place that God himself has prepared for me. Hallelujah. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. I hope to give that particular president a tour of my mansion some day in glory. He might want to get saved first. You're going to see God. He knows you by name. He knows the number of the hairs on your head. He knows everything there is to know about you. You are his. He has claimed you as his own. Your sons and daughters of the Most High God, and one of these days, after we have died, one of these days, we will see God. Hallelujah. I'll see him for myself. Mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me, in my flesh shall I see God. If there wasn't another promise in the book other than that one, it would be sufficient for us to believe in the resurrection of the dead. But there are many, many more, more than we'll cover tonight. Psalm 49 and 15, the psalmist writes that God shall redeem his soul and receive him. Very simply, as I've said, Psalm 49, 15, but God who? But God will redeem what? My soul 
from the power of the grave. You've got to decide right here and now whether you believe the grave has more power or whether you believe God has more power. And I'm here today to tell you that Jesus Christ risen from the dead proves, the empty grave proves that God has more power than the power of the grave. I thought somebody would shout about that. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave and better yet, he shall receive me. Hmm. What do you want to hear him say? I want to hear him say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter thou. Come on in. Enter thou the joys of the Lord. He will not only redeem my soul from the power of the grave, he will receive me. We belong to him. Thank God, thank God. Number three, there is a dividing line. We have in our traditions of our church a great hymn called, There's a Great Day Coming. A great day coming by and by. When the saved and the sinner shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? And here's a dividing line that's spoken of in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. The Bible through Daniel the prophet proclaims, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now, I want to make it clear that we do not believe in soul sleep. There is a church denomination that does. We just don't happen to be one of those. The Bible teaches us that to be absent from the body, catch that word, absent from the body. You know, here's my body, but I'm not so attached to it that I wouldn't leave it for this. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I hear a familiar thing going on around people in these days. The older set will say quite often this very thing. They'll say, you know, getting old is not for sissies. I think even Sissy Olson said getting old is not for sissies. And the longer I live, the more I begin to understand and know to understand that this vessel that I, my soul and spirit dwell in is nothing but dust. And to the dust, this body shall return. You said, what about ashes to ashes? That's not in the Bible. That's in the Book of Common Prayer. That's not in the Bible. My body will return to the dust. I've told my children that if they cremate me, I'll write them out of the will. You think I'm kidding. I've already purchased the grave so they don't have the expense of it. I know what I'm going to put on the stone, and I want it to shine as a testimony that anybody would have to walk by it and read it. Not of me but a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ who saved me. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the older I get, the less attached I am to this body. Some people think I'm less attached to my mind, but really it's my body that I'm less, less attached to. And so what is it exactly that is sleeping in the dust of the earth? It is this physical body. When I watched my mom depart from this earth, I could tell the distinct moment that soul and spirit left her body, and yet the body remained. It was the body that we sent to the funeral home. It was the body that we looked at at the visitation. It was the body that we preached the funeral over and opened up the coffin. It was the body that they delivered to central Missouri. It was still in the casket. It was the body there in central Missouri that they opened up the casket for those in central Missouri to see who were not at the funeral service, and it was the body that stayed in that casket when they close the lid. The body goes to the dust of the earth from whence it came. But the soul, hallelujah, is like a waiting falcon 
when it's released, it's destined for the skies. I have known at least eight people who have had near-death experiences, and they all pretty much share the same things. Carolyn Woolsey, the person whose memorial fund was what purchased our bass guitar in its case, and, and I'll never forget the statement that she made, her own lost son, her son was there that didn't know the Lord, and, and all of a sudden there she is, she's unconscious, she's not aware of any of her circumstances, she's going to die that day, and she rises up in her bed and she says to her son, I see heaven and it's beautiful, bloop. I love those kind of stories. It's just God revealing over and over and over again that his word is truth. My pastor, Larry Albo, literally died in a California hospital. And he expressed to me on more than one occasion that he had no fear of death because he'd already seen it. And he, like others that I could mention to you tonight, expressed the peace and the joy and the beauty, the glory of heaven. They revived him. They gave him a heart transplant. One of my favorite stories of all time is the heart transplant that Larry Albaugh had. He had the heart put into him that was of an 18-year-old girl. He lived 14 more years with that girl's heart in him. I asked him, Larry, does it kind of feel different having a woman's heart inside of you? He said, I quote, he said, yeah, yeah, it does. He said, occasionally I get this incredible urge to tell men what to do. <laughs> Fourteen years later, that heart began to give up, and the doctors offered him another heart. He said, no. No, I'm going to heaven. On the day that he died, just moments before he died, his son heard him singing, going to lay down my burdens, down, right, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, going to study war no more. And he went on to glory. Yeah, we believe in the body returning to the dust of earth, the sleep of this physical body that dies. But the Bible says that those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall do something. Uh, I think this would make a great movie. But I don't think Hollywood could equal its glory. Those who are asleep in the dust of the earth, help me, shall awake. That's the way I like my congregation. I like my congregation awake. And that's the way I like to th know and believe God's Word is true, that those who sleep in the dust of the earth, they're going to awake. Here's the good and the bad news. When they awake, some will awake to what? Everlasting life. And some will awake to shame and everlasting contempt. What a choice there is while we live on this earth, which destiny we will have. Will I have the destiny of awaking to everlasting life, or will I face the destiny of shame and everlasting contempt? But hear who the wise are. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Let's make sure that we're ready to awake to everlasting life. and not to everlasting contempt. Number four, the dead, I said the dead, shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Jesus relates this to us. John 5, 25 through 29, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now this is a little difficult to understand, particularly the first line of this verse. He said the hour, Jesus said the hour is coming and what? Now is. Of course Jesus will be crucified and we know from the pages of God's word that he who is crucified, he is 
put to death by the Romans, and of course the Jews are responsible for the death of Christ. His blood be upon us and upon our children. When he is put in that grave, that isn't the rest of what happens that day. What happens that day is recorded to us by Paul the Apostle when he says, Who is he that ascended, but he that descended into the lower parts of the earth? And what did he do? He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. I want, you to t I want you to know on the day that we're talking about here, as Jesus tells us about it, that day is the day that the dead in Abraham's bosom will hear, in paradise, will hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. Thank God. And all who follow them to the grave will live also. Thank God, thank God, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. We skip to verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. What are they going to do? Come on now, this is a freaky Sunday. What are they going to do? They shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The same thing that Daniel said in Daniel 12 is exactly what Jesus is talking about here when he says these words, some shall come forth that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Daniel the prophet, so many years prior, are, is speaking of the very same thing that Jesus speaks of here. Here, the choice to be made, whether you'll be awakened to the resurrection of damnation or to the resurrection of life. Thank God we can choose life and live. Number five, who raises the believer? Jesus will raise believers up. When will it happen? At the last day. John 6 and 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and what? believes in him may have everlasting life. How many of you believe in everlasting life? If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We don't just have hope in Christ in this life. This is an eternal proposition. This is everlasting life that Jesus promised and proved when he was raised from the dead. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And Jesus said, I will, I will raise him up at the last day. If my dad had a favorite verse... It surely had to be John 11, 23 through 26. I wish Dad could come back right now and preach this segment for us. Now that he's seen the glory of heaven, he's seen Jesus on the right hand of the Father, been reunited with loved ones gone before. My dad was thrilled at the preaching and the teaching of John chapter 11. If my dad were here today, he'd say what he said so many times in my past. Jesus said unto Martha, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She must have been reading Daniel 12 to know it. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Could we say that together? I am the resurrection and the life. Now, my dad would be ashamed of you for being that quiet. I am the resurrection of the life. And as sure as I'm standing here, my dad always said this, and I want to say it to you, Martha, you're looking at him. Martha, you are looking at the resurrection. Jesus. Martha, you are looking at the life. 
It is all about Jesus. Of all the claims in John, I am, I am, I am. Thank God for this divine claim. I am the resurrection and the life. Come on, church, rejoice with me. Because he lives, we live also. Thank God, thank God, thank God. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of excited about going. Glory to God. Let's, uh, yeah, let's just go. Come, Lord, come and get us. Wouldn't that be great? We're trying to plan a family vacation here at the end of June, and, and it's kind of wearing me out trying to plan a vacation. You know, a vacation or two weeks that are too short in which you are too tired to return to work and too broke not to. Planning a vacation is wearing me out. But thank God I have made my reservations. <laughs> I have made my reservation. And the details of the trip are all in my Father's hands. And when the trumpet sounds, I'm going to rise. Hallelujah. I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow. No more pain. I will rise. How many of you are thankful for the resurrection that's Jesus? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he proved it as he raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus come forth. Lazarus came out of that grave bound. They loosed him. He was alive. Thank God, thank God. He's supposed to stink, you know. After four days dead, you're supposed to stink. <laughs> they brought him out very much alive. If the, it just occurs to me that if the Lord can raise you from the dead, he can probably cause you not to stink. Just my thought. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Hello, Lazarus. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, I like this part, so much for soul sleep. Whosoever liveth and believeth, how many of you believe in him, shall never die. I'm not going to die. My body will. But I'm just going to change addresses. And I'm not even going to notify the post office. They can never get it right anyway. Nor could they possibly figure out where I'm going, where you're going when we change addresses. Hmm. Thank God, thank God. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 57 is so familiar, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. But um, we got to know some facts about the resurrection of the dead, and no chapter in the Bible gives us more information than 1 Corinthians 15, and we begin in verse 42. As Paul writes, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Just like Job said that his body's going to be destroyed by worms. <laughs> Yet this body that's sown as a seed in corruption will be raised in incorruption. It will be sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. I thank God for the power of his resurrection. It is sown a natural body. That's what goes to the dust of the earth. That's what's in the casket. That's what's in the grave. It is sown a natural body, but when it's raised, what is it? It is a spiritual body. Glory to God. I'm going to have a new body. Have a new hope of life eternal with the redeemed of God to stand. There'll be no more sorrow, no more pain. There'll be no more strife. Raised in the likeness of my Savior, ready to live in paradise. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. Thank God, thank God for a raised spiritual body. We skip to verse 49. As we have borne the image of the earthly, here's the promise. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this earthly body, it really is failing. Man, it's amazing. It really is amazing the deterioration of the 
earthly body. I uh, have a very deep bathtub in my house, and uh, it's got those jets that spray you real nice, you know, inside the tub. It's, it's really delightful. It really is. I've used it at least four or five times in three years. The problem is, I can get in it. Gravity helps with that. But I have a horrible time getting out of it. Because, let's face it, the old gray man just ain't what he used to be. My wife wanted to remove all the handicap bars that were in our home when we bought it. I told her, no, 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 I need those. <laughs> My father-in-law, 95 years of age, has always been a very independent, able man. Had a very successful drywall business in this county for a few decades and um, just always was a man's man, his own man, and, and uh, very strong so the day came that we thought we needed to buy him a chair that lifted him up from the seated position, reclining seated to an upright position where he could just step off the chair and, and walk. Oh, I don't need that thing. I don't need that thing. Well, we actually bought it for his wife, so he had it anyway. I can't even tell you how many times since then he has thanked us for that chair. I don't need it, I don't need it, I don't want that thing. Oh, I guess I need it. And then, of course, uh, he received, I forget who it was exactly, but someone gave him a walker with a seat in it. And I'll tell you, I didn't think he'd ever use it. I really didn't. I just didn't have faith to believe. But I can't tell you every day of his life, he uses that walker everywhere he goes, and it sure is better than a broken hip. It's better than a broken hip. And time and time and time again, he thanks us for that walker. He thinks that we just made all of this happen, and the reality is, at 95, he needs those things for his own safety, for his own well-being. He, he needs those things. I'm just 61. I can live with my arthritis. My bifocals fit just fine. I can live with my dentures, but oh, how I miss my mind. We have borne the image of the earthly Adam, but we shall bear the image of the heavenly Jesus. What a resurrection. What a nice change. What a nice trade. The resurrection of a natural body for a resurrection of a heavenly body. The resurrection uh, from a body that was like Adam, now to a resurrection that is like Jesus. Did you know that now we know in part, we just know partially, but then we shall know as we are known, get ready when we all get to heaven, I'm going to know you. And you're going to know me in spite of having a glorified body, a body that Jesus has given us, a transformation to be like him, we'll find out. We shall bear the image of the heavenly, that is the second man, the Lord from heaven, in verse 47. Verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. Everybody that stands at a grave ought to just admit it. This is a mystery. How in the world can you put a seed of corn in the ground and it produces a stalk of corn? How can you put a seed for tomatoes in the ground and it grows up in a tomato plant and produces all kinds of tomatoes? It's amazing how people plant these tomatoes in their garden and they're giving them away left and right because it's so productive as it begins a seed and comes up as a bunch of tomatoes. Well, here's a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I think you ought to shout about now. It's in a moment, it's in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. 
For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. I will gladly trade the corruptible for incorruptible. I will gladly change for this mortal body for an immortal body. Thank God in the twinkling of an eye, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Verse 54 ends this way, death is swallowed up in victory. And as Paul writes that, that's nothing new. It's found in Isaiah 25 and 8. O oh, death, where is thy sting? You know, I just uh, love that word. A lady in our church years ago talked to me about that word sting. When I, when I was a little kid, probably even a teenager, I'd get stung by a wasp, and it was a big deal. Mama, 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 I've been stung. Now, it's not such a big deal. It's just a sting. And guess what? It's over. It's a sting. It's over. And that's what death is. Death for every believer should be considered as exactly as the Apostle Paul taught it. It's just a sting. Hmm. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Verse 57, but thanks be to God which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you thank God for the victory right now? All right, here we go. Number eight, we know, we know the power of the resurrection. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 and 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Thank God the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken our mortal bodies. Number nine, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now this is interesting to me. It just, it always kind of makes my mind wonder about it, you know. My grandmother believed that when the rapture happens and the dead in Christ rise, I, I can't prove this in Scripture, I need to tell you, but my grandmother believed that the graves of the Christian will open. It's true of Lazarus. It's true of Jesus. She believed the graves will open, and what she told her family was, they will run to the cemetery to see who is gone and who was left. Just a, oh, man, that's a, that's a mind-blowing thought. I hope when you go see my cemetery, I hope that grave is open. I'm hoping that it's open. I believe and know it will be. He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now I want you to hear this. It's truth. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, but I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. If they don't have the hope of eternal life, if they don't have the hope of salvation, there should be all kinds of sorrow. But if you're a believer in Jesus and you believe in God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. It didn't say we shouldn't sorrow. It says we shouldn't sorrow as those who have no hope. Bill Gaither wrote one of my favorite songs. If Chris Halford outlives me, he'll sing it at my funeral. There's a room filled with sad and ashen faces. Without hope, death has wrapped them in gloom. But at the side of a saint, there's rejoicing, for life can't be sealed 
in a tomb. Come on, somebody shout. Don't sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe, it's that simple, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Help me. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, I'd like to be at my mama's grave when that happens. In a twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And what a shout, what a voice it will be that wakes up the dead. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Who are we going to meet? We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Here's the best part of all. You ready? This is the best. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Just like Job in Job 19, I know in my flesh I shall see God, that he shall stand on the latter day upon the earth. My eyes will see it. Here Paul writes, so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Number 10. You thought you were coming for a seven-point sermon, didn't you? And seven-point sermons are pretty cool because seven is the perfect number, right? So seven-point sermons are a perfect sermon. <laughs> You didn't see the humor in that at all, did you? Well, 10 is the number of completion. And this is completion. Beloved, now, right now, now are we the sons of God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Isn't that enough just to raise your spirit? Now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. After all, Paul had written, it's a mystery. John writes, doth not yet appear what we shall be. But there's something we know. We know that when, not if, when he shall appear, <laughs> we shall be like him. Would you please, please stop asking me how old we will be in heaven? Whew. It's an eternal day. <laughs> My goodness, it's not a carnal earthly body. It's a spiritual body. Why do you think it has years on it? Oh, can I be like Jesus and be 33? Forget it. Better than that. You thought you were good at 33? Better than that. When we see him as he is, we're going to be changed. And we shall be like him. How many of you know God shall wipe away all our tears? Come on, help me, church. God's going to wipe away all our tears. After being asked the age question in heaven, how old will I be in heaven? And can I still be married to my husband? No, you can't. We're married to Christ. I'm asked this question, how can there be no tears in heaven when we look there and we find that our lost loved ones are not there? My answer is just as before. We will see Jesus as he is, and we will be like him. As he perceives things, we will perceive things. His opinion will be our opinion. Thank God. As he views 
those that are his, that's how we'll view those that are his. And as he views the lost, so will we. We will have partially now the mind of Christ, but then we will have the mind of Christ. And the best day that you have ever lived on this earth will in no way compare to your first glimpse of heaven. The trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, we will be changed. Come on, we'll be changed. Who's that preacher running around heaven doing a marathon? Well, that's old Wakefield. He couldn't walk, but he... Who's that man that's looking at all the colors of heaven? Well, that's Pastor Jonathan. He didn't have color in his eyes. So he couldn't see colors in his eyes. And now he's just... Isn't that amazing? He's going to open his eyes in that eternal day, and he's going to see the glory and the splendor of heaven. I keep trying to talk him into getting these new glasses they have that let these people that are, are uh, unable to see color, uh, I, they let them see color through these glasses. And he doesn't want them. He says the first time he sees color, he wants to see it in heaven. I don't think it's going to be too long. We will see him as he is. And we shall be like him. So if you hasten off to glory, linger just inside the eastern gate. For I am coming in the morning, so you won't have long to wait. I will meet you in the morning. I will meet you in the morning just inside the eastern gate. I will meet you in the morning inside the eastern gate over there. There is come.